Welcome to our next lesson. Uh, by now we have covered perfectly competitive markets and monopolies. Uh, those two markets though are very much what we think of as the extremes. Right? Perfect competition makes some assumptions that are often a little bit unreasonable and that there's so many firms are all selling exactly the same thing, perfect information easy market entry and exit, that there aren't really many markets that are perfectly competitive. There's a lot that have a lot of the traits, so it is useful for us to study, but that's pretty extreme. Monopoly is just as extreme, right? It's assuming there's no good substitutes at all, and for most products that's just not the case. There are substitutes for almost everything. So for monopoly it's not, you know, that's an extreme case as well. Most market structures are in between. And in principles of microeconomics, we cover two, monopolistic competition and oligopoly. So as we said, we, in this section, we're going to cover two different market structures, monopolistic competition and oligopoly. The definitions for these, monopolistic competition has many sellers, just like perfect competition. It has perfect information, just like perfect competition. It has easy market entry and exit, just like perfect competition. However, no longer, uh, we are no longer assuming an identical product for all firms. Now we assume that the products are slightly different, differentiated. So that's monopolistic competition. Oligopoly uh, is really quite different than any other market structure we've talked about. We assume there's few sellers. Not one, not many, a few. Uh, product can be identical or it could be different. And market entry is difficult. Not impossible, but not easy. So first, we're going to cover monopolistic competition. So we mentioned the assumptions just a moment ago. Many small sellers, differentiated product, easy market entry and exit, perfect information, We'll talk a little bit about each of these. So for many, the assumption for many small sellers, we've talked about this before in perfect competition, so we don't need to talk much about it now. Large number of sellers, each firm so small it doesn't affect the other pricing decisions. And as we'll talk about soon, I think, I think fast food restaurants, or maybe even just restaurants in general, and gas stations are pretty good examples of monopolistically competitive companies. Uh, within a five mile radius, so if you go five miles in any direction from, from Susquehanna's campus, there are, well, there's so many restaurants, I, I don't know what the count is. Um, five miles takes you, I think it gets you into Sunbury even uh, from here, if not very close. So it gets you all of the 1115 Strip, it gets you south, it gets you some restaurants to the, to the west. Um, there might be 50 restaurants literally. Um, each individual restaurant has such a small decision on the impact on the pricing overall that it's really irrelevant. Uh, well, that's, that's why restaurants are a pretty good example of the, how small the firm should be. Product that's differentiated, uh, it's a real or apparent difference. Restaurants, I think this will be pretty obvious, right? Uh, if we look at fast food restaurants alone, within a few miles of Susquehanna campus, within five miles, I'm pretty sure we have more than one Subway restaurant, a McDonald's, a Burger King, an Arby's, and I think there might even be two Arby's. I think there might be one in the mall and one freestanding Arby's. Uh, Taco Bell, Wendy's, uh, Long John Silver's. This is a little embarrassing that I know all of these, even though, being said, I, don't, I have never eaten at a Long John Silver's. Um, what else is there? I named seven off the top of my head. I think there might be even more than that. Um, but you get the idea. There's a lot, but they're all different, right? I mean, Subway is not McDonald's, and McDonald's is not Burger King or Wendy's. These are different products. So consumers are no longer indifferent between going to one or the other, right? There, because there's differences, you may want to go somewhere else. Gas stations. You might think gasoline might be identical, but some stations do try to sell themselves that the 
yeah, their gas is better. And honestly, it doesn't even matter if it is better or it's not better. As long as consumers believe it's better, you'll have some consumers who aren't indifferent and may prefer one over the other. Also, some gas stations market how good their food is. Some could differentiate themselves um, based on how clean their place is. I know when we go on long trips, my family, my wife, if there's two or three gas stations, she tries to figure out which one will have the cleanest bathroom. And then that's the one we will get fuel at, and then the, you know, the family would, you know, would go in and use the restrooms while we're there. Um, you know, these are all ways you can differentiate yourselves. So gas stations can differentiate also on location. Uh, the key thing with, with a monopolistic competition is consumers are no longer indifferent between two choices. So advertising might matter, product quality might matter, service and packaging might matter, all sorts of other things are going to come into play. Easy and easy entry and exit into the market, we know, of, we know what this is. Uh, the one note on how we're different than perfect competition, if you open a hot dog stand in New York City and there's 50 other hot dog stands right next to you, you know you're going to get some customers, right? I mean, it's, it's hot dogs. People are going to buy your hot dogs. But if you opened up a new fast food restaurant, success isn't guaranteed because you have a product that's different. It might be successful, but it might not. So because of product differentiation, success is not guaranteed. So with these assumptions, we didn't put on perfect information, but that's the exact same as before. We do assume everybody knows about everybody else's pricing. Uh, monopolistically competitive firm is a price maker. Because the firm has a product that's different, they do have some ability to control the price. If McDonald's wants to raise the price of Big Macs a dime, they can do it. They'll expect slightly fewer customers for the Big Mac, but they can raise it. If they want to lower it a dime, the same thing. They might expect more customers for the Big Mac. Uh, but because the Big Mac is not, nobody else has that exact product, there is a little bit of power to control the price. How much power? Well, certain, a perfectly competitive firm, remember, had a perfectly flat, um, flat demand curve. A monopoly faces the market demand curve for the entire market. So a monopolist has a lot of control. Perfectly competitive firm has no control. Well, what about our monopoli monopolistically competitive firm? It's somewhere in the middle, right? They don't have a lot of control, they have, but they, have, they certainly have some. Less than a monopolist, more than a perfectly competitive firm. We'll see this in a moment, but in the short run, firms can earn profits. And that's like a perfectly competitive firm. But a monopolistically competitive firm in the long run, because there's free market entry and exit, if profits are to be made in an industry, uh, other firms will enter. So in the long run, we would not expect firms to earn profits. Now, I know when I first heard this, my first thought was, wait a second, are you trying to tell me that McDonald's doesn't earn a profit? And the first clarifying point is, remember when we say profits, we mean above the opportunity cost. So we don't mean they're earning zero, they're earning some amount of money, whether it's 30, 50, 80, 100,000 a year or more. We don't, you know, they're earning some amount of money, but they're just covering their opportunity cost. Uh, the one thing you have to consider it with, with something like McDonald's, yes, McDonald's earns pretty good money, a lot of money per store, but you have to factor in there is a special advantage that McDonald's has. McDonald's owns recipes nobody else has, and those have a tremendous amount of value. You have to factor that in on the opportunity cost. If McDonald's wanted, they could sell their recipe to the Big Mac, so other people could sell Big Macs. Um, if they wanted to sell that to Burger King, they could make a lot of money selling that. But uh, they, they don't. because but The fact that they don't, though, that is an opportunity cost, right? They could sell it because they're not and they're holding on to it. You have to factor that special advantage as a firm's cost. And that's where you, you know, the, they'll make profits that you wouldn't think are normal, but they almost, it's in a way you can almost think of it like they're having a hidden asset that's providing a return on their investment. They have the, the their hidden asset is these, are these secret recipes. Let's look at some graphs firm in a monopolistically competitive market faces a downward sloping demand curve. 
the firm, like all firms, want to maximize profit, well, what do we need to do first? We need to get that marginal revenue curve drawn. The marginal revenue will be less than the price for every, uh, at all quantities. This is exactly the same analysis as we saw with the monopolist. The reasoning again, if you're a firm and you're selling this amount right here, and you want to sell one more unit, you have to lower the price. But to sell that one more unit, let's say you're selling it for twenty dollars. If you want to, if you lower the price to nineteen, the extra revenue you bring in isn't nineteen dollars because you'll sell that one more unit for nineteen. However, every other unit you sold before, you now make one dollar less. So because of that, your marginal revenue will be less than that nineteen dollars, which is currently the price. Uh, we've drawn in the marginal cost, average total cost. Like every other firm, right? marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's the condition you really need to have in your head. And more specifically, the firm needs to find the output, find the quantity, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So this is the, the x-axis has the quantity, as it always does in this class. Um, so you have all of these various quantities the firm could sell. Uh, there's only one, though, where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. It's not here, it's not here, not over here. It's only at this point right here. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That tells you what quantity the firm will produce. Once you have the quantity, the firm figures, what's the most I could charge for that quantity? Well, to find that, you go up to the demand curve. And that gives you the price. So we know the price, we know the quantity. Here's the average cost per unit. The price is the average revenue per unit. This gives you the profit, right? You're making some, the price is a little bit more than your average total cost for each unit. Multiply that by the number of units you're selling, and that gives you the profit in the short run. What about losses in the short run? Well, once again, what we have to consider here is, is the firm going to cover its fixed costs, right? McDonald's has a building that it pays a lot of money for, and it has all this equipment. If it's losing a little bit of money in the short term, it's the question of whether to stay open depends exactly on how much money. And in short, is it, is it able to cover the average variable cost? If it's able to cover the variable cost, then they should stay open, right? And that would mean that you have these costs you can't get out of, like the building and the equipment. If you took those away, the firm would make money, but because of those, they're losing money. Well, in that case, in the short run, you want to stay open. Now, in the long term, you, you'd close, right? In the long run, if you lose money, you shut down. But in the short term, what you do is you compare uh, your, your average total cost, or I'm sorry, your price to your average variable cost. So here the firm tries to minimize its losses, right? Marginal revenue, marginal cost, intersection, gives you the price, uh, or gives you the quantity, and then the price, the average total cost is higher. Uh, it doesn't put this in, but in order for the firm to stay open, the average variable cost would have to be below the price. In the long run, as we mentioned before, firms will enter until profits are zero, right? Other firms will jump into the market with similar, albeit not identical, products, and profits will be zero, right? Price equals average total cost. But uh, one thing to note about a monopolistically competitive industry, the, it does not mean they're charging at the marginal cost. We've talked about in perfect competition, price equals marginal cost. And that's why there's efficiency. Here, if price equaled marginal cost, we'd be selling this, this amount right here. But we're not. Uh, what does that mean? That means we'll have a deadweight loss. And we don't show it, but this little triangle here would be a deadweight loss triangle again. However, there's a huge difference between a monopoly and a monopolistically competitive firm. Uh, so the monopolistic competitor does produce too little and charge too much, just like we say of the monopolist, because the price is set higher than the marginal cost. So that's 
when the price is margin equals the marginal cost, you're producing the right amount, you have economic efficiency. But there's a huge benefit of monopolistic competition relative to perfect competition, and that's variety. Um, yes, the pro there is a markup, right? Um, and the firm doesn't make money on this, but the markup means they're not selling as much as would be efficient to sell. But because you're in a monopolistically competitive market, when you go to eat, it's not a hundred hot dog stands, like what you could think of maybe perfect competition. It is uh, McDonald's and Arby's and Burger King and Subway and Taco Bell and Friendly's and Applebee's is a competitor, competitor for those, individ, you know, those firms. The trade-off for the inefficiency is greater variety. And it's, we, we don't value the variety in these models. Some people, there are some economists who work on trying to figure out what's the value of these types of things like variety or what are called non-market items. How do you value that? There are economists who have developed some pretty sophisticated tools to look at that. It's beyond the scope of the class, but just know variety has a lot of value. right? The fact that you aren't stuck eating one type of restaurant every time, that's valuable. Uh, so there is some inefficiency because price is above marginal cost, but there is a lot of value from the extra variety.